So we've been talking about how to classify different kinds of life forms and in this lecture series we talked about the fact that sometimes animals are more similar to each other than other animals and that's why you put them either in, the, in a closer taxa or in a closer uh, branch of the tree of life in whatever way you want to look at it. Either way, when you look at these two animals, for example, you see that there's a lot of similarity between them. I'm sure you would guess that they are close to the tree of life or they, have, they share a taxa. But what do they share? Do they share a species? Probably not. Do they share the genus? Maybe not. Do they share the class or the order or the family? How close are they to each other? How do you determine that when you first see it and you discover a new animal to put in the tree of life? Well, there are some things which we learn from evolution that help us determine the branching of the tree of life. And one of the things you can look at is homologous structures. Other things you can look like is the DNA structures and things like that. So now we're going to talk about how scientists use systematics to actually establish the, the branches of the tree of life and actually create the trees of life that we talked about before. So, like I hinted, sometimes there's a lot of similarity and sometimes there's a lot of difference. See here, for example, there's a lot of different types of freshwater mollusks, which are a lot of different types of shells. There's also a lot of different types of saltwater mus mussels, which are a lot of different types of shells. And we use the characteristics or the morphology of these shells to separate them. But at what point does the two shells, which look very similar, belong to things of different species? And how do these characteristics can help you determine how you organize them either hierarchically or in the branches of a tree of life, which is phylogeny? How do you answer questions like that? How do you transfer something from characteristics which they share or do not share together to the actual tree of life? So... One of the ways that we actually look at is looking at the actual morphology. Clearly, you see here that these animals are going to be completely different from each other, so it's going to be easy for you to classify them in completely different groups because they will act different. In other words, they will have different niches. They will also have different looks. And remember, sometimes the niche, the, the niche test is a different way to look at it because you, they have different roles. Some are predators, some are prey, some are competitors from each other, some are actually at different, completely different roles or habitats in the environment. So you can look at morphology or physiology, you can look at the ecological role or the behaviors that the animal display. You can also look at paleontology or the fossil record to actually help create different things. And you can also look at molecular biology. Now, the leading part of, of of biology today is actually looking at the molecular biology, which is the DNA, RNA, or polypeptide, which is a protein, sequence of the code, and analyzing the similarity that exists between animals of different species. For example, looking at the hemoglobin uh, protein, you will see that humans are 95% the same as the rhesus monkey uh, in that protein, but only 87% the same as the mouse, or 69% the same as the chicken, or it's 54% of the frog, or 14% of the lamprey. What that tells you is that we're probably closer to the monkey taxa, which so we share a taxa that's uh, narrower with the monkey than we share with the mouse, then we share with the chicken, then we share with the frog, then we share with the lamprey, and so forth. And you see, that will help you to determine the evolutionary relationship that exists. But how do they even do that? Well, basically, they, know, they do a genetic analysis of the, either the protein code or the DNA code, and look for molecular homology or similarity that exists at a DNA code. Look for you, for example, in these two particular DNA codes, you see homology in the code over here. There are some pieces which are still exactly the same. And these homologies may indicate that the code was originally the same, but that mutations have happened that changed this code. But still, even though the codes look very, very different, look for this, for example, there you see that a code here and a code here. They may look very different from each other, but if you, you may notice that, in fact, there's regions of the code we actually match, and you have that highlighted. So, and all that happened is that new insertions happen in between, or, or added gaps have been added. So a computer program will scan the genetic code or the protein code and look for similarities in the domains of proteins or the sequence of the DNA code to help you determine how close you are and for the whole, how close the two animals or species that you're comparing are actually are. Doing this kind of molecular biology analysis is the alternate way to actually look at the similarities that exist between the animals. And using these kinds of systems, we, we develop things which are called phylogenetics, which are trees of life based on comparisons of the genetic similarity that exists between the different species. And in that way, you can see, for example, this particular phylogenetic tree is tracking... Um, 
the composition of several different kinds of bacteria and you see the different kinds of branching that's going on and based on the genetic analysis of the genes of this bacteria. Now, when you're actually looking and trying to do this kind of systematic analysis, how do you know that something is homologous instead of analogous? Because remember, if you see something that's similar to another thing, it doesn't necessarily mean it's homologous. Because remember, why are we even looking for homology in the first place? Because remember, if you share a common characteristic, it probably means you share a common ancestor. For example, you can tell that the woolly mammoth and the modern elephant are very, very similar to each other because they share a common ancestor. So everything that's similar about them may be because they actually share their common ancestor. So they both have tusks, they both have long, you know, uh, heads, big heads, you know, we have the, 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 the long noses, they have the big broad bodies, the, the stubby legs which act like columns, they have the short tails, they have hair and all this stuff, they're both mammals, so they all these things they share in common is because they share common ancestors. So the homology between them, the level, the quantity of homology between them suggests that they're very, very close in the branches of the tree of life. But there has been some sort of adaptive radiation or the evolution changed them because of different time periods or different conditions or different environments that they were exposed to. And we learn about that in the evolutionary lecture series. But how do you differentiate between that, uh, between the homology, and simple, simple things which are just coincidentally the same? For example, you see the falcon, the pterodactyl, the bat, the, uh, um, and you also see a uh, fly, all that have wings which are structurally very similar or analogous to each other. So how do you differentiate between the bone structures of humans, cats, whales, and bats, which are so similar to each other because they share common mammal ancestor with the similarity that exists between the wing structures of the different um, uh, flying creatures that exist in the world? In other words, how do you differentiate between divergent evolution and convergent evolution? Well, in systematics, we call these analogous structures um, or, or things which are very, very similar, we call them homoplasies or similarities that exist on, on when you actually look at the, 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 the code or morphologically. Now, this particular slide, you're looking at morphological differences, but you can also do it in DNA differences like we talked about in the previous slide. Now, the key here is the following. If you share a common ancestor that has that characteristic, then it has to be homologous. For example, both the, the common ancestor of the elephant and the woolly mammoth both had the tusks. So you can pretty much say for certain that they, they, the tusk is a homologous structure, not an analogous structure, unless it had evolved parallel or in both of the branches. But that's not exactly the case. So normally, when it actually has that much level of similarity, it's because they have a chemical a common ancestor. Likewise, if there's a great degree of similarity in extremely complex structures, it's probably homologous. Because what are the chances that complex structures which are so, so complex are going to be exactly the same in completely different branches of the tree of life which do not share the common ancestor? You know, that's most likely going to be analogous structure. But what are the chances of an analogous structure being exactly the same if the structure is extremely, extremely, extremely complex, this could be very, 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 very unlikely. For example, if you actually look closely at the wings of all the flying creatures, you will see that although overall all of them have wings and in that sense it's analogous or, or a homoplasy, you will see that it's in fact very, very different in actual complexity of the structure and therefore it's a hint that the fact that it's not a homologous structure and that's in fact uh, analogous structure. So to review, if you actually have a um, structure which is not shared by the common ancestor, it's most likely analogous instead of being homologous. And if the structure is such a great degree of complexity and the similarity is a very, very great similarity, it's probably a homologous structure because the chances of very, very incredibly complex structures developing exactly the same way, completely separate from each other, are very, very slim. But again, it would be helpful if you can trace back the common ancestry and see if they have that same feature. The best way to do that, of course, is look at the fossil record or look at DNA history evidence to actually see if they're going to be the same. We'll talk more about that when we do the cladistics and evolutionary clocking later in this lecture series. But either way, what I'm talking about here is that 
to, confuse, to clear the confusion between homology and analogy, you have to look at the common ancestor and the degree of similarity and degree of complexity in the structure you're analyzing. For example, if you actually look carefully at the, uh, the wings of the different things that fly, you will see that they're very, very different from each other in actual complexity level. And that there's not a great degree of similarity at the, at the, in terms of the complexity level. And therefore, it's more likely an analogous structure than a complex structure. On the other hand, the complexity level and similarity degree in the bone structure of mammals is extremely high. And it's more likely, therefore, uh, going to be a homologous structure. A great example of this, by the way, of using the fossil record is looking at thermoregulation. Birds and mammals both um, regulate their internal temperatures. So a lot of people wish to think that that was an example of a homologous structure that indicated that we share a common ancestor. The thing is, though, that birds and mammals share a common ancestor, which is an ancient type of reptile that did not regulate its internal temperature according to the fossil records, which indicates that it's not an, a homologous structure. In fact, it's an analogous structure. Thermoregulation evolves separately, convergently, between the mammals and the birds. In other words, both had the same advantage of being thermoregulators and therefore they ended up in the same um, trait. But there are so many other differences between them and, and the common ancestor does not share that trait that you can pretty much certainly say it is not a homologous structure and this particular kind of homoplasy is actually analogous. All right. And by looking at these different kinds of homology and Analogous structures, the scientists can then create a picture of the history of development of the different species and actually put that in the tree of life and solve the problem that we talked about. And we'll talk more about this on the next lecture series when we talk about cladistics. I'll see you guys then.